Season's greetings, listeners. You are listening to Movie Phone Call, a podcast show recorded on my iPhone. Today we'll be discussing Jason Reitman and Diablo Cody's reunion with Young Adult, and I'll be doing a top five countdown to my top five worst movies of 2011. But let's begin with Young Adult. What are you doing back in Mercury? Or you, you move back? Or of course not. Gross. Here's the deal. Buddy Slade and I are meant to be together, and I'm here to get him back. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's married with a kid on the way. Nope, kid's here. I'm cool with it. I mean, I've got baggage, too. I would keep all of this to yourself. I would, I would find a therapist. <laughs> okay, so what you've just heard from the trailer, the movie sounds like a very, you know, peppy, silly, goofy comedy. And uh, many people have been led to believe that this movie was going to be like a rambunctious uh, comedy. But the fact of the matter is you've got Jason Reitman, who is a very, you know, serious director. Even when he's directing comedy, there are still very serious tones to his work, especially, you know, his last film, Up in the Air. And then you got Diablo Cody. This is her third screenplay, uh, the second to actually be good. Uh, I'd rather not look back at Jennifer's body. But, uh, you know, Juno was her debut film, and that was a very, you know, uh, sweet, innocent film about uh, young love and how teenagers deal with certain issues that are mainly, they're going on in everyday society. So it's just focusing on one particular teenager. With young adult, what people were expecting was, like I said, a rambunctious comedy, when the fact of the matter is this movie was extremely dark. Probably the darkest uh, work uh, Jason Reitman has done. I mean, uh, granted, Thank You for Smoking does deal with some dark topics, but it's still funny. And uh, Juno is, you know, a very lighthearted film. And Up in the Air is kind of like the modern-day death of a salesman, but mixed with some good amount of dramatic and comedy, so I guess you can say dramedy. But Young Adult, you know, it has funny moments, but not enough to really consider it as a comedy. I guess, I mean, it would be considered a dramedy, but, you know, what we're dealing with here is a very crazy main character. It's funny how those initial instincts can be so right, you know? I mean, you make all these mistakes along the way, but the world will make sure you end up with the person you're meant to be with. It's good to keep those people in your life. The people who really know you best. Mm-hmm. And that new baby of his is just darling. Have you seen it? Up close? The film focuses on a young adult author named Mavis. She uh, is a slob, for lack of a better word. She is a, a big, particular kind of slob. She uh, has a fetish for Diet Coke, two-liter bottles, she eats lean cuisine, she has a really ugly little dog that uh, she carries everywhere she goes, and she she lives like a teenager would, and I guess maybe it's the way that her mind works and how she writes these young adult books. Her background from high school, she was known as the the high school queen, the popular girl that everyone wanted to be, everyone wanted to be with. And so her character cannot seem to get out of that mentality that she's better than everybody else, when the fact of the matter is she's not doing too well for herself, and she's just too blind to see it. She receives an email from, uh, well, actually, she receives a chain email from a friend notifying that her ex-boyfriend, played by Patrick Wilson, just had his first baby. And after seeing this email, something just clicks. Or I shouldn't say click, something snaps in her brain. And she comes up with a notion that she can win his heart back. So Mavis decides to travel back to Mercury, Minnesota, and bluntly shows up and tells her old high school boyfriend named Buddy Slade, I'm back in town, let's get together, yada, yada, yada. I mean, you know, he falls into the trap of, yeah, let's rekindle. But when you see these 
these meetings between both Mavis and Buddy, they become frightfully eerie to watch because she is on the verge of a psychotic, obsessive individual. And Buddy, you can see in Buddy's face that he's smiling like, okay, okay, when am I going to leave? In the movie, Mavis runs into an old classmate named Matt, who was not the popular kid from his old high school days. I'm sorry, but I, I, I think we went to high school together. At the same time? Yeah. You're Mavis Gary? Mavis Gary Crane now. I'm Matt Freehoff. Uh, my, my locker was actually next to yours all through high school. Matt. Freehoff. Yeah. Yeah, your, your locker was right there. Right next to mine. We didn't run in the same circles. You were, you were pretty popular, if I remember correctly. You won best hair. Did I? What did you win? I didn't. Uh, they usually give out like 15 of those and, and only to like the same five people. He was a nerd. He was, you know, a short, stocky, fat kid. And many people believed he was gay. And uh, some jocks, they ruthlessly beat him senselessly, leaving his one leg extremely damaged where he has to use a, a walker for the rest of his life. And his... Um, well, a certain man part of his is pretty much damaged, and uh, it's not working out well for him. And you get these really interesting conversations between Matt and Mavis. Matt, of course, is played by uh, comic Patton Oswalt. And, you know, he's a very uh, sarcastic character, like he usually is in real life. But, you know, there's a very sweet, sensible guy there. And Mavis is just too stupid to see that there are good people out there who, even though they weren't popular, they were still at their best. And in the movie, she can, she continues to believe that, you know, back in her high school days, she was at her best. And Matt confronts her and tells her, Mavis, you weren't at your best. If you had took the time to notice me and talk to me and understand me, I was at my best. And it's just, it's kind of a tragic way of looking at things when she continues to believe that she will always be this popular girl and she will always be above everybody else. I had these mixed emotions. I didn't really know how to feel after seeing this movie. It was all too realistic, I guess. I, I knew a few of these kind of people in high school. There, there weren't many, but there were a few who were, you know, popular and thought they were better than you. And when you sit back and watch this movie, you're, you're thinking, oh, okay, yeah, okay, I do know that person. And then after the movie's over, you're sitting there and wondering, huh, I wonder if they'll end up like this. Chances are they might not, but there's that little part of you that thinks, God, it would be awesome if they ended up this way. Because how the movie ends, it's not the typical cookie-cutter, you know, everything's okay ending. I guess that's sort of a spoiler here for you, but um, I'm not going to give everything away. It does end in a very unconventional notion. You think the movie's going to go this way when in actuality it's going to go in the more realistic ending. And that's where people are going to contemplate if that was the right choice. I sat there in the theater thinking to myself, was that the right choice to end this movie that way? It was a bold decision. I don't think I would have personally done it because it definitely left me feeling a little empty inside. And a lot of people leaving the theater were all baffled and saying that there was no conflict and this movie made no sense. It was stupid. You know, I'm like, well, okay. First of all, the portion of the audience was uh, senior citizens. I do live in uh, Delray Beach, Boca Raton area in Florida. So there weren't many viewers at that screening that were in my age group. If anything, this movie is for the people who grew up in the 90s and even uh, teenagers of today because there is a better connection with these characters. For instance, the character of Matt, he uh, brews his own, uh, I think it's scotch or, or uh, some kind of single malt liquor of some kind. He brews it himself and uh, he has this aged uh, Mose Isley first edition and 
you know, old people are not going to get that. But Mos Eisley, you, the first thing you think of is, oh, Star Wars, Mos Eisley. Um, and it's kind of funny when uh, Mavis has the Mos Eisley uh, select, and she's like, whoa, what's this? And he's like, Mos Eisley, it's, you know, Star Wars, you wouldn't understand. The character of Matt, he uh, brews his own, uh, I think it's scotch or, or uh, some kind of single malt liquor of some kind, he brews it himself. And uh, he has this aged uh, Mose Eisley first edition. And, you know, old people are not going to get that. But Mose Eisley, the first thing you think of is, oh, Star Wars, Mose Eisley. Um, and it's kind of funny when uh, Mavis has the Mose Eisley uh, select, and she's like, whoa, what's this? And he's like, Mose Eisley, it's, you know, Star Wars, you wouldn't understand. I guess the target audience for this movie is not really meant for the um, generation of the... I mean, I don't want to sound cruel or anything, like the 50s or the 40s. I, I you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm being a little too harsh on that side. Maybe uh, this movie could be for everybody, unless they could... Unless they can't think back to high school. But for people, you know, in their 20s and 30s of today they can think back pretty quickly of their high school years and reflect on these certain types of people. I have to get into uh, Charlize Theron's performance. I, this was probably one of her best performances in a few years. She really gives a freaky performance. This is borderline psychotic. <laughs> it's just, it's so crazy. And she has, sometimes she has these moments where, you know, she's hugging Buddy and then she smells his hair and he's not even looking and she gives looks to other people and uh, they're hugging. You know, it's really obsessive. And she gives a great obsessive performance. And this probably was one of her best performances since uh, her Oscar-winning role of Monster. Patton Oswalt, he was also terrific in this role uh, as the unpopular kid who starts to befriend the popular kid. He's a tragic character because you feel bad for what he's been through, and this person does, doesn't even acknowledge him except, Oh, you're that guy. You're, you're the, oh, okay, I remember you. You were, they beat you up because you were a fag. You know, he said he's not gay. People thought he was, but he wasn't. And when the news kept uh, bluntly saying, Oh, this uh, gay kid was beaten up by jocks, and then he kept telling everyone he wasn't gay until finally they found out he originally was not gay. It just became a story about a fat kid being bit, uh, beaten up. But Patton Oswalt's character is someone I think a lot of people can relate to because he is a more realistic person. He, he is a real person dealing with real problems and trying to move on with their life and uh, accept the world for what it is and who's around them, which kind of juxtaposes the mentality of Mavis and how she can't seem to do that. She just has one visual standpoint of the world, her world. Within the movie, uh, she's writing her final book in this young adult book series that she's um, the ghost author of. While she's writing the book, it sort of parallels the experiences she's having while trying to uh, win the heart of Buddy. And it's a tool that I think has been done before in a movie. The It's not coming to mind right now which one, but it does seem like a familiar tool to move the story along, to make it, you know, relatable in some sense. And even though it seems a little cliche, I do like how she comes up with her characters by borrowing other teenagers, in a sense, 